Thank you, Eunice, for that introduction. My name is Josh Coleman, and I have the pleasure of serving as the LGBTQ liaison for Mayor Randall Woodfin here at the City of Birmingham's Office of Social Justice and Racial Equity. We're so excited that you are joining us for this Furry Freedom Fest virtual celebration, and we're so excited to bring you this outspoken panel. Before I bring out the full panel, I want to introduce you to someone who is one of my personal heroes an accomplished and nationally recognized LGBTQ civil rights lawyer and advocate who has served as the Deputy Attorney General for Civil Rights for the Office of New York State Attorney General. He then served four years on the Governor's Cabinet as Deputy Secretary and Counsel for Civil Rights, and then was appointed by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo to serve as Counsel to the Governor, where he served as the Governor's Chief Counsel and Chief Legal Advisor and currently serves as the national president of the Human Rights Campaign, the first person of color to hold this position in the history of the organization. Let's give a Magic City welcome to Alfonso Davis. Thank you so much, Josh, for that kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak at the Birmingham's Freedom Fest. As you heard, my name is Alfonso David, and I am the president of the Human Rights Campaign which is the world's largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer civil rights organization. It is a pleasure to be with you all today as we celebrate the transformative power of music and to find empowerment in each other for the work ahead. Alabama has a deep civil rights history where champions of justice like Reverend Fred Scuttleworth, Shuttleworth and Rosa Parks refused to accept violence and oppression in their lives and transformed our nation in the process. Their legacy of resistance and resilience is still with us today, but so too are the toxic forces of anti-blackness and white supremacy, which they fought so long against and they sacrificed so much to defeat. Over the past several months, many non-black people have woken up to the fact that black people are still living in a state of deadly oppression. We've also seen a rash of horrific violence at the hands of police against black people and black trans people, from George Floyd to Breonna Taylor, from Nina Pop to Tony McDade. We've also seen an epidemic of violence against black trans lives intensify with horrific consequences. More than 180 transgender and non-binary people have been killed in this country since 2013. Just this past weekend, we learned of at least three transgender and non-binary individuals who were taken from us by violence. Two of those victims were black transgender women. In addition to all of the unacceptable violence, black people and non-black people of color continue to be the hardest hit by COVID-19. This is because our systems have put us on the front lines, which exposes us to more risks. And in the midst of this pandemic and all of the risk that we confront, people have said enough is enough. People of all stripes have taken to the streets, risking their health and their well being to protest racism and police brutality. If we're living in a state of fear, if we're living in a state of oppression, if we're living in a state of regression, we are saying that it cannot be worth it. We must fight back to claim the essence of our democracy and the fundamental principles of fairness and justice. This is a moment of national reckoning, but it is one that is painfully overdue. Over 50 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, black people are still living in a country that for the most part has been more devoted to order than to justice. When I returned to this country as a refugee with my family, I saw firsthand how the freedom of this nation and the promise of this nation was one with dangerous consequences and contingencies. As a black teenager in Baltimore, I quickly came to understand that my life was considered less important because of the color of my skin. And as a gay man, I came to understand that living my truth would cost me greatly from acceptance in my own family to opportunities for pursuing my dreams. My lifelong career and commitment to advancing civil rights is in large part formed by my experience growing up in a country 
where we lived in a democracy one day and it became a dictatorship overnight. It was also formed by the gaps between the best promise of this nation and between my own experiences of how far we are from freedom for all. It all comes down to this. If I'm not free as a black man, I cannot be free as a gay man. My LGBTQ black and brown siblings across this nation who live every day under the oppressive force of white supremacy cannot be free until the systems built to uphold it are transformed to truly serve all of us. We also know from our own nation's history that the LGBTQ movement would not exist without transgender and gender non-conforming women of color. It was Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Miss Major Griffin Gracie, and countless others who refused to bow before police brutality and oppression at Compton's Cafeteria, at Stonewall, and other sites, and they changed our nation forever. Their resistance laid the groundwork for the modern LGBTQ rights movement. But our movement moved forward largely without effectively answering the cries of those who threw the first brick, those who were and still are heavily targeted by police, LGBTQ black and brown people. Last year, a few weeks before I joined the human rights campaign and before COVID-19 shut down much of the country, I embarked on a listening tour to hear directly from community leaders. Trans leaders of color, including leaders in the South, told me of the violence, the harassment, the discrimination, and the utter indifference they faced. They told me about how they have been treated as disposable by those who were supposed to be protecting their interests. These advocates made it clear that both our movement and our nation has failed them. This is a failure that we must all urgently address. The only way for our entire movement to move forward is to embrace anti-racism and end white supremacy, not as necessary corollaries to our mission, but as integral to the objective of full equality for LGBTQ people. This is a commitment that I and the Human Rights Campaign take seriously, and it is commitment that builds on years of work in the South and across the nation to do better to dig deeper, to center the most marginalized. Five years ago, we decided a, to make a substantial investment in Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas to accelerate the pace of progress for LGBTQ equality across the Deep South. Since then, our reach and our impact on the ground continues to grow in meaningful ways. We have been deeply invested in defending and advancing LGBTQ progress at the state and local level including leading the charge on the passage of non-discrimination ordinances in Birmingham and Montebello. In addition to working to elect pro-equality legislators, we are constantly engaging people to be citizen advocates, conducting advocacy trainings across the Deep South. Through our HBCU program and the annual HBCU Summit, we are working to empower and support LGBTQ youth leaders on campuses and in their communities in the South and across the nation. We also know that part of our struggle for justice must include addressing systemic health inequities because HIV and AIDS still disproportionately impacts LGBTQ people of color, particularly black, gay and bisexual men and black transgender women. Our focus has to be supporting black LGBTQ advocates doing life-saving grassroots work in our communities. And we are deeply grateful for the partnership and the leadership of organizations like AIDS Alabama, who have been doing critical work in this space for years. The Human Rights Campaign has also created two new programs to assist Black trans leaders in capacity building and leadership development. And in addition to capacity building, we're focused on economic empowerment, establishing targeted task forces in communities hardest hit by the epidemic of trans violence and expanding public education programs. We have also seen that religion and faith are all too often used as tools of discrimination instead of tools of love. But the cornerstones of religion and faith and the LGBTQ movement are the same, inclusion and justice. LGBTQ people in every faith condition and tradition and LGBTQ people of faith have more similarities than they do differences. 
That is why I have been convening in person and now virtually with diverse houses of worship to strengthen relationships with faith communities. At the same time, in Alabama and across the country, the bedrock right of our democracy is under attack. Since the Supreme Court's terrible decision in Shelby County versus Holder, anti-equality forces have launched a coordinated assault on the right to vote. The Human Rights Campaign and partners across movements are committed to making sure that all of us are able to vote safely and fairly in the pivotal elections that are ahead. Because part of this systemic transformation will necessitate a pro-equality victory in November, an election now only a little over 100 days away. Defeating Donald Trump will not fix our broken system, but we know we cannot fix it with him and his anti-equality enablers in the White House and in the Senate. We must elect pro-equality leaders who believe in the necessity of change and then hold them accountable for their part in the work ahead. That work includes passing the Equality Act, which will guarantee full protections for LGBTQ people across this nation in every facet of life. And that is incredibly important, establishing robust policies and systems that treat black lives and black trans lives as lives worthy of protecting. That includes divesting in police and actually investing in our communities. And that includes supporting our LGBTQ youth so that they can see themselves in our shared future. Our fight, our fight for collective liberation has always required all of us. Bayard Rustin, a close collaborator of Martin Luther King Jr. organized the March on Washington and was a key figure in the civil rights movement. Pauli Murray, a black gender non-conforming legal and spiritual leader laid the intellectual groundwork that brought us that much closer to gender justice. The Black Lives Matter movement was established by leaders like Alicia Garza and Charlene Carruthers, who transformed leadership as we know it, founded in black queer feminist uh, women. And in this moment of crisis that we are all experiencing, there is so much healing and so much hope brought by leadership of two transgender black leaders in Minneapolis, City Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins and City Council Member Philippe Cunningham. Jenkins and Cunningham were the first and remain the only openly transgender back leaders serving elected public offices in this country. We may come to the struggle from different backgrounds and we carry different experiences with us, but our fight for liberation is one and the same. As Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in Birmingham, quote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. It is that shared destiny that we must fight for now. One that is centered in love, centered in justice, and in making real the promise of freedom for all. Thank you very much for having me. And Josh, I will now turn it back over to you. Thank you, Alfonso, for those empowering remarks. And we're so excited that you're here with us today. Let's go ahead and bring all the panelists on. Hey, y'all, I really wish we could be together because this is such a dynamic group of folk. But I'm so excited that you're here with us celebrating Freedom Fest. Let's go ahead and do some introductions, and then we're going to answer the first question we have lined up, which is what does freedom mean for you? First of all, we have Sincerity Banks, who serves with Birmingham AIDS Outreach in the Tea Hill Department. Sincerity? Hi, I'm Sincerity Banks with Birmingham AIDS Outreach, the Tea Hill Project. I'm the project case manager. What freedom means to me is finding something that you believe in, standing in solidarity, standing up for yourself, living out loud, and living in your truth. Next up, we have Representative Neil Rafferty, who represents the 54th District here in Alabama. Representative Rafferty? Hey, everyone. Um, Representative Neil Rafferty with House District 54 here in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I would say what freedom means to me is to be able to live your true authentic self without fear of impediment or discrimination. Well, and certainly not last or least, we have our great friend, Representative Cannon from the great state of Georgia. Welcome. 
Hey there, y'all. Really, when we talk about freedom here in Georgia, we are talking about reproductive justice, the ability to live and parent and enjoy your life in safe communities where you have resources. I'm proud to be a full spectrum doula here. And so when we talk about freedom, we're talking about that lived and embodied experience that I think we've all addressed so far. Well, as I told you, we got a remarkable group of panelists with us today. Let's continue the discussion. Sincerity, me and you have been friends for a long time. We've both grown over the years, and it's remarkable that we're both in positions to advocate on behalf of our community. The work you're doing with Tea Hill here in Birmingham is having a profound effect on the transgender community. Can you talk to us about some of the hardships experienced specifically in the transgender community here in Birmingham? The hardships that we face here in Birmingham are one, we don't have a lot of people that support us. We need more comrades, we need more allies, we need more people to stand up and come to the front lines and protect us, speak up for us and support us. Also, it's a lot of lack of employment. We also have this situation where people are status shaming. So therefore you have people that don't wanna get out and get tested and get involved. If we stop status shaming first and stand in solidarity with each other as a sisterhood, as trans women of color, we could do better instead of tearing each other down. There's a lot of times that a person's perception can be taken in a court to where they will not wanna deal with you. So different perceptions of how they view trans women needs to change. Thank you, Sincerity. We are always a strong advocate for the community and your voice is much needed now more than ever. So we appreciate all the work that you continue to do at T Hill with BPO. Um, Representative Rafferty, during your election, you were so open about who you were and you were elected as an openly gay man in District 54, the seat previously held by Patricia Todd, who was the first openly elected official here in Alabama. Your election was a big deal for a lot of folk in the community. Uh, it gave a voice to people who felt voiceless and it really empowered uh, a lot of folk to get involved, whether it's in the political process or volunteering with organizations. So I wanted to know if you could talk to us a little bit about your motivation for running for office and just some experience that you've had while you've been in the seat and touch on how other members of the community can feel empowered to get involved. So I say that my motivation for running was twofold. For one, the fact that Patricia Todd, the only openly gay uh, person in the in Montgomery, was stepping down. Um, so I was afraid that the LGBTQ community would lose that voice in the legislature. Um, so that was definitely one of my motivations. The other one is I'm actually a colleague of Sincerities at uh, Birmingham AIDS Outreach, where I worked in public health um, and was on the front line and in the trenches dealing with uh, the racial and economic disparities that uh, persist in our city and in our state. So I wanted to go and fight for, make sure that there was better access to care, transportation, housing, um, opportunity, and even credit. Um, to those that want to get involved, I would say absolutely, we, I would encourage you 100% to find however, uh, which way is best for you. Some people might be running for office. I'm happy to talk to those people and connect them with the right resources. Some people might be volunteering um, or grassroots organizing. Uh, the thing is, is that none of this can happen. Um, no, no change can happen with just one person. It's gonna take all of us. Thank you. We're so happy that you're uh, in office and we look forward to the reelection campaign and we look forward to you continuing to serve the community. Um, and speaking of serving, Park, uh, Representative Cannon, uh, me and you served on a panel a while back on College Democrats, uh, and we've both grown a lot since then, and you have been all over. Uh, you can't Google Park Cannon without everything popping up. Uh, and so one of those, a CNN article that you're featured in says that you believe the importance of identity and expression uh, is important, but it shouldn't detract from all the other issues. Now, there's a lot of issues facing the country now, and in particular, the queer community. Can you expand on um, what are some of those uh, issues that are facing us right now? And just talk to us about what your top priority is as you legislate in Georgia. Well, it is my honor to be on this distinguished panel 
as the youngest and only openly queer legislator in Georgia. Our Equality Caucus this year, the chair, Carla Drenner, she helped to sponsor House Bill 426, which is Georgia's first anti-hate crime law. So when we had that conversation in the public, people wouldn't want to talk about status recognition for LGBTQ families. But we persisted and we made sure that in alignment with the conversations around the Supreme Court decisions, et cetera, that sex, gender, and sexual orientation being included in Georgia's first version of the hate crime bill was a magnanimous feat. And the LGBTQ community was right there at the helm of that. I'm actually here in this room with my LGBTQ liaison, Jennifer Barnes Balenciaga of the House of Balenciaga. And we will continue to make sure that we legislate to provide justice and understanding for our transgender and gender nonconforming communities. Our top priority has been increasing visibility by actually making sure that people are showing their tangible support for the transgender and gender nonconforming community. And we speak directly to our community to make sure that we are staying in line with the conversations that we need to move forward. So I am always fired up about some of the things that were said by the representative around running for office. When we run, we win we actually are able to bring our own safety and our own wellness to our communities in the ways that we know, because we understand that elections matter. We are just a few days away from an election here in Georgia. And so we are trying to do immediate um, legislative work to secure our elections in Georgia. We are talking to the Secretary of State, to the boards of elections. If you saw the article with the place called Park Tavern where everyone in Georgia waited in line for six hours, where they normally maybe come have a casual stroll or go to the ice skating rink for the winter, it just was not a great example of how our democracy works. So we're working hard to make sure that as we legislate in Georgia and as we see these elections happening around our country, that we uplift our other leaders. So I'm happy to be here with y'all today. Thank you. And we're so happy you're here with us. Alfonso, this panel is made up of elected officials and advocates, and you uh, are uniquely positioned to help both succeed. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the human rights campaign and the role that it plays to ensure the protection and well-being of LGBTQ community in both of those arenas, both advocacy and elected officials? Sure, sure. So the human rights campaign is the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the world. And we focus on a variety of things, but for purposes of this conversation, I'll highlight the work that we do in electoral politics as well as the work that we do in policy and legislation. So uh, every election cycle, we endorse candidates for office. We identify candidates who we believe will support LGBTQ equality, and we endorse those candidates by supporting their, their candidacy, by working with their respective uh, offices to make sure that we can provide them with resources and support in their races. In addition to that, after we get elected officials into office and last election cycle, we endorsed more than 400 candidates all across the country, um, including candidates running for president, candidates running for Senate, House of Representatives, as well as local races. After those elected officials come into office, we also work with them to make sure that we advance legislation to protect LGBTQ people. One of the most significant pieces of legislation we're working on is the Equality Act. And I mentioned the Equality Act because it will provide comprehensive protections to LGBTQ people in all facets of life, not just simply employment, housing, public accommodations, credit, education, transportation, retail. Many people don't know this, but there is no federal law that prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ people in public places. That includes doctor's offices, the movie theaters, 
when you are seeking services from a place of public accommodation, there is no federal law that protects LGBTQ people. There are state laws, but there are no federal laws. And so there are 29 states in this country where there are no comprehensive protections for LGBTQ people. So we're working both at the federal level to pass the Equality Act. It recently passed the House of Representatives. It is stalled in the Senate. And we're also working at the state level to advance legislation to protect LGBTQ people and also beat back bad LGBTQ legislation, anti-LGBTQ bills that are looking to relegate LGBTQ people to second-class citizens. And we fight both in terms of affirmative legislation, but also we work to beat back defensive uh, legislation that will hurt LGBTQ people. I know that we're thankful uh, for the work that you're doing. And we're so thankful for the boots on the ground here in Alabama that are truly making a difference. Um, I know that we're gonna be a little short on time and there's so much that we wanna talk about. So I wanna do just a rapid round of question. Uh, the first thing that comes to your mind, just when you, you hear this sentence, just the first thing that comes to mind and we'll go uh, through everyone. Everyone has seen the nice yellow and blue equality symbol that is now behind Mr. Alfonso David. So I just want to know what is the first thing that comes to mind when you see the equality sticker? You'll see it on folks' laptops or their uh, bumper sticker. Uh, what what comes to mind? Uh, and and sincerity, let's start with you. When I see the Human Rights Campaign logo, I either believe that it's someone that works for them or volunteers or has taken the time that wants to represent them and let people know that they're allies and comrades. Quote Tony Morrison here, and that is, if you are free, you need to free somebody else. And if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. So I think that part of allies, allyship and providing that support is, uh, is, is standing up for what is right. That means addressing those disparities and uh, directly confronting the embedded white supremacy in our system. Um, once again, if we're talking about access to health care, access to transportation and opportunity, we're talking about creating safe spaces and venues for, for people to um, be themselves and to be uh, free to express themselves. Um, so that's what I think being, uh, being supportive and being an ally is. Thank you. Alfonso, you touched on the Equality Act, and I know that there's a misconception that the Supreme Court ruling recently over workplace protection is the end all to be all for protections for the community, uh, but we know that's not so. Can you talk a little bit about what work is left to do uh, specifically in southern states like Alabama? Sure. So the recent Supreme Court decision said that Title VII, which is a federal civil rights statute of 1964, uh, prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of sex. And the court said on the basis of sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity. That decision reaffirmed court decisions for the past 20 years, that LGBTQ people are protected under federal civil rights laws for employment. The court decision defines sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity. So what that means is other federal statutes that, dis that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex should also prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. But as I said before, the Equality Act does not, the Equality Act provides additional protections that federal law does not currently provide. So I'll give you an example. When we return from COVID-19 and you're going from one place to the next, from your home to your office, or you're going from your home to the movie theater and you use an Uber or a Lyft, there is no federal law that prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ people for transportation hubs. Or if you decided you wanted to purchase new clothing and you went to a Neiman Marcus or a Gap department store, pick the department store of your preference, there is no federal law that would prohibit discrimination against LGBTQ people in retail establishments. And it also extends to race. There is no federal law that prohibits discrimination along the lines of race in those circumstances either. The Equality Act would fix that and provide comprehensive protections for LGBTQ people and also fix the laws as it relates to race. And we'll also need to fight to make sure that we provide protections in states 
There are many Southern states that have no protections at all. We recently fought in Virginia. Virginia became the first state in the South to provide comprehensive protections to LGBTQ people in employment, housing, and public accommodations. That does not exist in any other state in the South. And we have to fight to make sure, as the elected representatives mentioned today, that we advance LGBTQ rights, we advance state legislation to protect LGBTQ people in many parts of the South. Thank you for expanding on that. I know that we have a long way to go in sincerity. In Birmingham, we've extended some protections. We've created laws and the non-discrimination ordinance, and we strive to create an affirming culture, uh, but that's not all that we need to do. So I wanted to get your opinion on what's next for the community. What else needs to be done for the community here, and what can people do to really help bring us to the next level? We need to support Black trans women, we need to also stop status shaming. We need to also stand in solidarity. We need better protection. We need people to stop misgendering. We need people to become very affirming. Do the work. You know what I'm saying? Learn people's pronouns. Learn respect. Respect plays a big part in the whole beginning stages of the situation. Let's work on fixing these marginalized communities. Let's work on protecting the girls that are getting murdered. Trans women are at the forefront of getting murdered. And I understand that there's a lot of different things and situations that's going on, but that's something that needs to be addressed. A lot of times there's a lot of undisclosed cases of trans women that were murdered here and they were misgendered. So it plays back to community leaders. It plays back to police officers and people that serve, some of these people that serve on boards need to voice their opinion, not be scared, open your mouth, be heard, be seen, be visible. That way your impact will be the best impression you'll ever make. Thank you, Sincerity. I think a lot of uh, what we have left to do with the work uh, may be around the cultural norms in the South and how that impacts us. So Representative Cannon, can you expand and talk to us about how cultural norms of the South impact the LGBTQ community? I agree with Sincerity again. I mean, we are just on it today. You know, the stigma, it continues to permeate from community spaces all the way up to the legislature as it relates to HIV in our communities, as it relates to mental health in our communities. That's why we continue to advocate for funding in the budgets that are possible to help our communities. We were able to have even our Republican Governor Kemp sign legislation to allow for a pilot program for PrEP access. And that's gonna be really important here in Fulton County where we're also recommending uh, intergovernmental partnership between the county and the city funded to get more peer navigators and to actually call into question who their staff are and how if they have communities where staff members can get together and speak about their experiences, the, how those experiences are valued and are responded with the correct type of action. We look forward to reminding everyone that as much as it is a Bible belt, we can take that thing off. We know how in our ways that religious norms have hindered and helped in our community conversations. So we call people into the conversation on how we move some of the seemingly so ingrained suppressive structures at times. White supremacy here in Georgia, the conversations that would lead us to why we can't get our funding through for prep programs in our counties that need it, it writes it itself. And so we're glad to just be here uh, reminding people we're here, we're queer, we're without fear. We will continue to stand up. Our ancestors are speaking and walking right here with us. So I look forward to joining y'all some point in Birmingham. And uh, thank you again, of course, for making space 
for us to talk with each other. I know that from our allied platforms, we will each address cultural norms in the South. Yeah, you, you said it. When we work together, there's no doubt what we can accomplish. And uh, Sincerity touched about stigma and uh, Representative Cannon touched a little bit about it. So, Neil, I was thinking you also serve as the director of the Bee Chip program. Uh, can you tell us what that is and mm -hmm. talk to us about any challenges that you faced working to ensure quality HIV prevention services mm -hmm. when all the community here in Birmingham? So BTIP uh, is a Birmingham Comprehensive High Impact Prevention. It has a uh, multiple uh, wings to it that target um, HIV prevention efforts towards uh, the black gay community and black straight women. Um, I think that some of the challenges that we've been seeing is a, a lack or a dearth of venues that cater towards that specific population, um, as well as marketing and messaging for PrEP and other prevention tools that have uh, that have come up um, within the past uh, five five to ten years, um, making sure that they have access to them and that they know that they're available for them. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Neil. Um, we could go on talking all day. We could continue, but I know that um, Eunice has other programming that we need to get to. So thank you all for joining us for the virtual experience. I'm so excited that we got a chance to connect um, Park and Alfonso. Uh, I know I speak on behalf of everyone when I say you have an open invitation to join us in Birmingham whenever you can, and we would love to have you. Um, thank you, you all for joining us and watching this uh, outspoken panel and um, y'all just have a great day.